right, so what I want to do today, uh, this evening, is just share with you a little bit about uh, the, the whole issue with pest control in tunnels. I've got a little bit of experience in, with this, and um, uh, hopefully this will be of interest to you. How many of you have a tunnel? Anybody growing a hoop house besides Liam? <laughs> okay, well, good. So now I expect you all to have hoop houses next year when we come back to talk about something else. And uh, Mr. Leon Sloan, will, he'll gladly sell you one, okay? All right. Well, that's a picture of me, believe it or not, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, a lot of things have changed in 20 years. Uh, back then I had a little hair. I don't have so much hair now, and the hair has got grayer for some reason. A lot of things have changed. Hey, guess what? There's more tunnels now also. A lot more. When we started doing this work in 95, People didn't know what the world you were talking about when you're saying growing in a non-heated greenhouse, grow vegetables. What? What's, greenhouses are for ornamentals. They're for potted plants. And it was a paradigm shift even for me. And uh, when I went to these various conferences and I saw what other people were doing around the, uh, the, the nation, I thought, man, we could do that in Oklahoma. But here's the deal. Change happens. Uh, to all of us, to things that we're involved with. The tunnels have exploded. The one thing that has not changed, though, pests. They remain the same. They continue to be problematic. And if you don't address that, you're not going to be successful in your tunnel. Now, the greenhouse... Climate control is similar, but we're not going to go there because my experience is limited in that uh, realm. And so I'm going to confine my remarks to these non-heated passive structures referred to as high tunnels or hoop houses or what I usually refer to as high tunnel hoop house. For those of you in the nursery trade, they're called cold frames. Same thing. Okay, here we go. Trying to work one and do the other here. So these are some considerations let's visit uh, tonight about. The structure, location, and ventilation. All these will, will bear, uh, keep in mind, will have, have bearing on how we maintain and how we manage our houses for pests. Combination rotation, sanitation, soil solarization, exclusion, irrigation application, and method. Fertilizer and irrigation scheduling, biological control, and then chemical control. All right, now that seems like a lot, but I'll go through these fairly quickly because we don't have time to go into a lot of detail on any particular one, nor is this the, the venue for that. All right, let's, let's look at the structure location uh, first. Uh, yeah, does this remind you of some places you've been? Um, Micah, some of these houses, especially the NRCS houses, are on farmland. And invariably, uh, I've seen a lot of them put on, on areas like this that have no drainage. And so, so what's the big deal what, uh, in terms of uh, pest management? From a disease standpoint, this is a disaster, right? We don't want our houses full of water. Um, not only is it miserable for the grower and for your help, and if you've got customers in there, but, uh, you know, that's... That, uh, it's, it's bad from a humidity standpoint because of all the extra moisture, plus just the, the root zone, the saturated root zone. Remember, most of these soils can, due to capillary activity, it can suck up this water, and, uh, and to, even into beds. And so this is, this is a no-no, absolute no-no. So what we've ended up recommending at times, if necessary, is to, on slope ground, is to build a, a, a pad. Now this is kind of overkill. You know, but it's for, to, to, this is a house location uh, for one of our houses, rather, in, in, in Ardmore. We wanted to demonstrate how to build a pad, a properly designed pad, for a, a structure on a sloped piece of ground. And Yeah, it did cost several hundred dollars to do this in soil, but uh, hey, you know, it works. There's no water in this house. It's dry. It's what you want. And then we see this a lot, or I have, uh, certain parts of the state, uh, eastern Oklahoma, for example, 
where you've got hills and you want to grow in these things and you stick them next to a hillside, right? Not only you have issues with sunlight, you've got to have sunlight to grow plants, to grow product, but uh, you limit the airflow. And again, uh, limited airflow, you, you, uh, you have issues with uh, humidity, and when the plants are wet, the foliage is wet, then you have accentuated disease uh, issues. So we want airflow. See, the nice thing about a tunnel is you can restrict airflow by lowering the sides or putting windbreak material, but you can't create air. You can't, you've got to install fans. These are passive structures, so you get them out there. The best place is kind of like when you think about where do you locate these, where would you put a peach orchard? Up on the hill, where you get a lot of wind. Now, <laughs> Oklahoma times we get wind that blows things away, but that's the, the point is, you want movement of air through that house to not only liberate the heat, but you, you keep it dry and you dry the, uh, the foliage. Um, how do you orientate the house? Well, you know, Greenhouse 101 says you always want to run your structures north and south for better sunlight distribution. There are times, though, if you need airflow, you might want to look at running them the other direction, you know, east and west. So you get that south wind that can move that air out, depending on the size of your house. It all depends. I hate to sound like an economist, but it does depend. Depends on your location and what's around you, what types of... Uh, natural um, phenomenon, trees, hills, whatever. But uh, in Oklahoma, we have enough sunlight intensity. It really, you're, you can be successful if you manage the house properly, regardless of what direction the house is oriented. We have some that are running, you know, northeast to southwest type of thing. You know, angle, okay, a little different, but, you know, I mean, I'm kind of like to square my houses up with the world. I use a compass, you know, kind of thing, but hey, it'll work. You gotta just get some wind through that house. We just saw an example of a ridge vent with Leon's house. He mentioned hot air rises. Wow, what a novel concept, hot air rises. And we've known that for, for thousands of years, right? So you, you put your vent at the very top of the house where it tends to accumulate, that's the most efficient way to vent the house. The problem is, with these ridge vents on these large houses, they're a problem to maintain. How do you get up there and fix that thing? You know, I mean, there's ways to do it. A lot of times you have to take the plastic off to get to that, to repair that, that top vent, the way that this particular one opens with a, a roll-up uh, mechanism. So, um, yes, that's an excellent way to vent. That's, what we, that's, that's the mecca, have that vent up there. But it, it's a little hard to engineer and it's hard to maintain. But that's kind of where we want to go. When we started working with tunnels, especially the ones that I uh, uh, noticed and, and observed back east, way back in the 90s, a lot of these tunnels had three-foot sidewalls on them. And I'm thinking, well, I didn't know. That's just the way they're made. You bring them back to Oklahoma, you start growing, and they say, wow, you just not get enough airflow through there. So it's funny to see how things have changed over the years. Again, we, we started with, I think, four foot in the 90s. And then we moved to five foot. And then we moved to six foot height. Um, now we've got sides that you can just push all the way up as high as you can get them increase airflow, all right? So that's, a, if there's a take-home message, is don't limit movement of air in that house. Design them where you can get as much air through them as possible to dry it out. That looks familiar, Leon? Yeah. yeah. No, that's Moore's. Anyway. It's one of his crazy ideas. He's always come now. Excellent idea, right? Open that end up. Nothing obstructing air on that end. A little hard to to uh, assemble, right? For the but it has its purpose for if you're going to have a machine in the a tractor moving in and out of that house. But there's not a problem with airflow. 
The one on the right is one of our first ones we made back in the 90s. Uh, we had removable end pa panels on there, and our, our door could swing open. We had a top vent. That's the only thing I knew I had to do at the time. It worked pretty good. It was kind of a hassle to make, but again, the concept. Once you, know, you get kicked in the head enough times with that heat, then you want to uh, decide you know, there's, there's, you've got to spend some money and some time building a house that you can open up and vent. All right, let's move on to plant population. Everyone's guilty of overplanting these structures. Why? Why do you people cram plants in there like uh, you see, you know, in, a, in an elevator during rush hour? Why do, why, why do, why do people, um, you know, plant their tomatoes six inches apart in these houses? Oh, well, yeah, when they're small, they are small, right? When they're, well, look, if the house costs you four or $5,000, you know, most thinking people would say the more plants I can get in there, the more yield I can generate, and the more I can uh, pay this thing off, the quicker I can pay it off, right? But there's a limit to growth, and it gets to be counterproductive you cram so many plants in there that none of them get what they need in terms of nutrients, water, and sunlight. So everything suffers. You dumb down the whole system. You'd be better off spreading them out, giving each plant what it needs, but not so much from a yield standpoint, plant performance. Again, let's look at pest management. How do you get air to move through that, that jungle? So it stays moist. If you do have an issue, if, if, uh, whether you're sprinkly irrigating, which is crazy, we'll talk about that a little bit inside of the house. Um, but if the foliage is wet from a very high humidity, you've got a, you know, a relative humidity that's very high, you hit the dew point in the morning, water condenses all over the plants, how do you dry those off? When it's like that, no water, no wind, wind can move through that canopy. So, don't overdo it, you know. Stay with a, a, a good management plan in terms of your plant spacing and, uh, and allow the sunlight, allow the air to move through there, okay? And every plant, depending on the variety and the type of plant, has its spacing requirements. And everybody has their, you know, of course, tomatoes, it varies, right? If you're growing them in a cage or you're going to trellis them up. You're going to grow them on a string, like a an indeterminate variety, or if you've got determinant, are you going to grow them with stake and weave or in a cage? All that will depend on how much space you need to ensure that you get the right yield and uh, a good yield and uh, the airflow that you need. All right. Half fans, horizontal airflow. Now this is not what most high tunnel hoop house growers would install because they're trying to, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a hoop house. It's passive. This is active system. But sometimes you have to do this to get the airflow you need. If you're in one of those crazy spots, Micah, where there's no, you don't get any airflow through the house, if you don't do this, disease is going to eat your lunch. So sometimes you have to. You have to have horizontal, horizontal airflow fans. So is that a hoop house or a greenhouse? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a modified hoop house. It's not climate control that has no heat in it, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily a high tunnel either. So it is what it is. There's no law says you can't do this. You do what you got to do, right? Okay, so here are the uh, uh, t two diseases that are really problematic is, is powdery mildew. Uh, that is the worst one that I've noticed in my time growing and what I find most growers are having issues with. You can do everything you can to try to, to uh, minimize the problem. You can have good plant spacing, adequate plant spacing, and, and a lot of move, air movement in the house. You'll still get this. Uh, so the idea here is just to try to select disease-resistant varieties. That's the cheapest form of disease control. If, if, if it says it on the label, on the, the, uh, the variety description, then stay with that. Obviously, it has to have some good horticulture characteristics. With it, you don't want to buy a, you know, a, a plow horse 
and uh, it's got disease resistance. So, okay, well, if you're not going to make any yield off of it, what does it matter? So a good variety from a horticulture standpoint plus disease resistance. Every variety has a code or every um, uh, you know, seedsman, uh, seed company, will, will, they breed these. They'll list them, seed catalogs, what they're resistant to. Um, and there's different codes to use, and here's just a few of them. All these different uh, uh, combinations of letters. I remember when I started in, <laughs> way back in the day, 40 years ago, right? Uh, we had tomatoes that were VFN. That was it. Look what we have now. Now, most of these are just from standard breeding um, uh, processes, techniques, where you introduce uh, characteristics from other wild plants into them. Some of them, however, are genetically modified. That's up to you what you choose to plant. Uh, if, if that's taboo to you, then you're going to just have to rely on the old standard practice. But there are some, some really novel uh, genetics from uh, G GMO uh, sources of that technique that are providing resistance on a lot of these diseases that we would never otherwise have with traditional uh, breeding techniques. Um, so, if it's in the plant, that's the cheapest form of, of uh, disease control, if it's, if it's in the genome, so to speak. All right, and then grafting is becoming more and more of a, a, a topic that's becoming popular among growers, um, especially well, the tomato growers. I know in a lot of cucurbits this is done also, but uh, with some of the, the heritage brands, of, uh, of, of plants that don't have the heirloom, if you will, don't have the disease resistance in them. You can graft them to some of these disease resistant varieties as rootstocks, just like you would a pecan tree. You've got a rootstock, and a scion, you know, they grow the improved variety. Same thing, um, it's a little technique that you can utilize that will bolster that disease um, uh, tolerance and resistance and allow them to grow in especially infested soil. Something to consider. The nematodes, an issue in some situations. Okay, and then of course disease-free transplants and then good quality seed, right? Now, how do you know? <clears throat> Most reputable seed companies screen. They know where their, their seed stock is. They know uh, how they're being taken care of and so forth. And they evaluate those. They screen them. So when you buy seed from Johnny Seed or from Harris Moran or, you know, Reuter, whatever, uh, that's not the correct pronunciation, by the way, of that. Um, so there are a lot of good quality um, seed companies that have reputation. If you, if you just get them from the neighbor or you save your own seed, rather, uh, sometimes, you know, they will be in, infected. I know virus diseases, some bacteria uh, can, are seedborne. They carry over. And so... Just be careful, you know, um, if you're going to be selling those types of things, you really need a license and you need to know what you're doing or you get yourself in trouble. I remember several years back we bought some strawberry plants from uh, uh, a vendor in Arkansas and it was a disaster because the plants were contaminated with uh, anthracnose, uh, fungus disease. And they looked okay, but they didn't perform worth a darn. And, uh, Evidently, they were handled improperly or grown improperly, uh, and they were infected in the greenhouse there in, in that location. And I know there were other growers that had the same issue. So know where you're getting your plants. Combinations and rotations. Um, what I mean by combination is it's easier from a management standpoint if you're growing things that are similar. For example, the cucumber and the squash have same management uh, requirements, same fertility, same uh, moisture usually, uh, and the same pests. So you can treat the whole house. Now we're all guilty of planting all different types of things in the houses, okay, because we only have so much space. However, when you do that, if you get one crop contaminated, you spray it, sometimes you'll get some spray residue on something else that it's not labeled for. So how do you manage that if you're using pesticides? And then, of course, it, 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 it really complicates your, your water and your fertilizer you know, application. If you've got 
several different kind of crops. For example, let's say strawberries and tomatoes in one bed. My goodness, how do you manage that with the same irrigation line? Especially when you're fertigating, putting fertilizer through the irrigation system. So those can be issues. So I like to keep it simple. I like to have the same crops, same families together in the house, and then I rotate those. No, you shouldn't grow the same thing in the house year after year after year. That's just good common sense practice. So uh, either you have you rotate, or you have several houses that you can rotate in, but among. Okay, things to think about. This is a no-brainer, right? You start seeing something that looks a little funky. Uh, in these houses, things can spread really quick. It's a perfect environment. So the nice thing about container plants, if one of them is infected or contaminated, it's easy to get out of the house. And you don't have to dig up the bed or remove the plastic mulch and so forth, as you would uh, with a standard kind of field culture inside of the house. Sterilization, just uh, common sense keep things clean, um, especially if you've had issues with nematodes and some soil-borne diseases in other houses. I always like to dip mine in 10% Clorox. Uh, my, my, uh, this is some, uh, uh, you know, a post hole digger. We were used planting a six inch, four or six inch uh, containerized tomato plant, so we needed this to, to prepare holes in our plastic mulch. Just to make sure I didn't uh, spread a lot of stuff, I would just dip every time uh, I did this. Now it was, it was burdensome, but it, you know, I, after you lose the whole house from pythium, uh, root rot, yeah, you'll do it. And then this is, of course, Clorox, and then Oxidate is a souped up hydrogen peroxide. It's OMRI listed. It's, uh, it's good stuff, and it's for the same purpose. It, it, it kills germs. Try to limit movement from, from field to, the, to, the, to the, uh, the house. If I had a choice, I would rather work in the house early before it gets hot, uh, and then I would go to the field. If you're in the field, sometimes you'll pick up mites, whatever, and uh, you'll bring them back into the house where they go nuts, okay? Um, now, <laughs> sometimes you can't, if you've got uh, guests and you're giving tours, <laughs> Get ready, right? Um, this is an issue we have at the Noble Institute and educational uh, programs and so forth. If you've got, pick your own inside of the house and you're going from outside to inside, that could be an issue. But sometimes you can contaminate, that's all I'm saying. Whether it be on your shoes, if you've got walking through disease uh, soil, that's typically not a big deal, uh, but it's more the insects that can, you, you can drag in with you. Mites, aphid, you know, thrips, whatever. And then just keep the house clean between crops. I like to clean them out, uh, remove all the weeds, plow down stuff, let it decompose. It's just good, uh, good, good practice for uh, pest management. And then keep weeds out around the house if it's possible. Now some of these slides are not mine. I'm just putting them in here as a, if in a perfect world this is what we want to do. You don't want weeds growing everywhere around the house. They're just, you're, you know, environment for, for bugs, right? And then soil sterilization, or solarization, rather. It's not really sterilization, it's more pasteurization when you solarize soil. But what we're doing here, we're just heating the soil up for a, at a particular uh, temperature for a particular amount of time so that we can kill some of those pathogens in the soil, those bad boy microbes, um, some weed seed, some insects. It does have some effect on, on nematodes, depending on how deep you can, you can treat the soil. But uh, this is an effective tool. It's been tried and, uh, and, and proven to work. I've used it successfully. Uh, it is somewhat of a hassle, but if you're looking for a natural way to control pathogens in the soil, this is excellent. Uh, it's not impossible. Let's look at this. You see what the thermometer says, guys? 140 degrees. Wow. Hey, in Oklahoma though, right? It gets, we have this thing called summer heat. And we can complain, we all complain about it. It's miserable to work out in the summer. But you know, something that you have to think about, and from a positive standpoint, when life serves you lemons, make lemonade, right? Why not use all this heat to control insects and critters of all types, pathogens? We can, it just takes a little time. 
But you close up a house and you cover that, those beds or containers with plastic, you can really put a hurt. And another benefit is it mineralizes all that organic matter and it releases an incredible amount of nitrogen and nutrients. Um, yeah, I've tried it, it worked. And uh, it, to the point of you, you release so much nutrient, we've actually taken compost, actually it's not compost, it would be a, a horse, horse uh, stall cleanings. Threw them raw into a, a container, right? Not composted, threw them raw into a container, mixed it with the soil, solarized it, not only did we con control all the pathogens, but we released all the nutrient from mineralization and, and we would plant, come back and plant a crop in that and never fertilize it, for example, with our strawberries. Uh, one year never fertilized it from uh, when we planted in the fall through the, until we got to the spring where we needed to add a little extra. It really is an incredible process. I love this process and we can really use, take it to advantage in Oklahoma. Now you can also do it with, in combination, I think Lynn mentioned the uh, uh, mustard. This is uh, just basically biofumigation. That's what we're growing in this house. He's turning that under soil moist, moisture. You want to keep that up. Close the house up. You can put a, uh, a plastic over that to kind of hold in the, um, the fumigant, so to speak. What happens is this process that he alluded to right here. Glucosinolate. That's a natural compound in the, in the plant cells. Once they're ruptured, once you, you, you till under the soil, you mow it, then there's an enzyme, oops, there's an enzyme that converts this to isothiocyanate, right? And that's cyanide, right? That's what does the job. It's, it's like, a, like Vapam, you know, we used to have, a fumigant that uh, does a number on these uh, pathogens and some insects. And so when you combine it with the solarization, you just, it's like a synergy. It works really good, but it does take some planning. And in the house, you can make this work to the utmost degree by, because you've got the perfect environment to make this work. Okay, hang with me, I'm about done. Um, containers, this is what I was alluding to. These are 15 gallon containers we grew tomatoes in. We added the manure to them. You, this is ideal. This is based on University of California work in the nursery industry. They take a pallet, put uh, there a, a 12 polyethylene, 12 uh, inch, probably like three gallon polyethylene um, container, just a bag container. Fill it full of your mix, wet it down real good, cover it with two layers of plastic. And what research has shown if you can, this is crazy, I never realized this until I read this, 140 degrees, if you can maintain 140 degrees for 60 minutes, you'll do the job. 60 minutes. And I've been doing mine for six weeks, Micah. Dang, I've been overkilling. But what I've done, what I've done is I've released, I've mineralized, I've released some of that organic matter. It takes longer for that organic matter breakdown than the, to kill the microbes. But this is, this is in your, uh, in your uh, handouts, how to use this. Excellent process. 2009, I was in Israel, and uh, they sell a lot of produce from Israel, goes to, to Europe. And they're really big in these net houses. And is this a hoop house? No, it's a hoop house frame, greenhouse frame. They've just put net over it. And uh, they exclude the Mediterranean fruit fly. Uh, they don't want any, any maggots in their fruit in Europe, so they're forced to do this. There's a big problem with that in Israel, believe it or not, in the desert. So you see thousands of acres just like this, just a net over it. Now, you're excluding the bugs, right? Here's the three biggest, from my experience, what I've noticed in my houses, these are what I have issues with. Aphids, spider mites, and thrips. All soft-bodied. Um, and it takes a certain screen mesh to you know, ex exclude these critters, right? And they're using a very fine uh, mesh over there. So here's what we're finding. Uh, for exclusion of these very small-bodied insects and, and the uh, spotted wing drosophila, they want very, very fine, less than a millimeter, you know, a third of a millimeter mesh size, very small. And then with the 50% shade fabric, you can get, take out the moths and the beetles and the, um, you know, the grasshoppers and stuff. 
The issue with this material though, it's very fine and it really reduces your wind flow, guys. So you have to take that into account, um, especially if you're just using it on the sides. Wow, you, you've got to be careful. Um, it might work better if the whole house has that on it versus just on the sides. Only experience will tell you that, and I don't have experience using that fine of, of, uh, of mesh. Tracy, you might have, or University of Arkansas is doing a lot of work with this material on their hoop houses. Visit with them. By the way, if you come to HIS, the day before our meeting start, there's a high tunnel tour of all their work they're doing with fruit at University of Arkansas at Fayetteville the day, the afternoon before the meeting start. Be there. <laughs> okay. You can weave it between the hoops like this as a way to, to, to attach it to the side or you can roll it up and down like that, like we've done both of these over the years. Um, this is a little cheaper method and you just raise it and lower it. To, now this, is, this is the windbreak material. The sh actually it's more shade, shade cloth, not the very fine mesh, but it does work to keep out some of the bigger bugs. There's your lightweight row covers for pest exclusion. What might work is to use the very fine mesh on the inside and then put the, uh, the, the larger mesh, the windbreak over the top, uh, if you wanted to just, to just manage the structure for, for, for bugs. Okay, but this is an alternative to keep the, the small, small critters out, during the, especially in the winter, fall, and spring. Keep in mind, we've got a vapor barrier here, right? This is, that's what we have, a, that's what the plastic is, it's a vapor barrier, and that helps save on the irrigation, but it also keeps things from drying out. So what does that have to do with the way we irrigate? This is Uganda, 2012, I don't know, I was over there teaching a, a, a course on, on putting these structures up. This is one of the structures, and I told them, do not irrigate during the summer. Of course, it's always summer, right, in Uganda? They don't, it doesn't freeze there. I told them, do not use sprinkler irrigation. You're going to really accentuate your disease issues. Well, I get home, and then a month or two later, Somebody sends me a picture, and Mr. Upson, we have all these problems in our house. The, the foliage looks like this, and I said, and then they send me this picture, and they're watering inside the house with a sprinkler, and I'm, ah, you know, that's the problem. So you need drip. Anyway, don't do this for the warm season crops. It's okay. Uh, can you water inside a hoop house? Sprinkle irrigate? Yes, you can. If you're going to try to moisten the soil if you're, before you bed, right? If you're trying to leach salts out of the soil, you can run a sprinkler. Just don't do it on a, on a summer crop, that's all. We, we water, use the water on, on our um, spinach and our greens all the time. It's a different critter though, the temperature and the type of crop. But on the solanaceous crops and on cucurbits, don't do that. That's, that's not a good thing. All right, and then fertilizer and, and water scheduling. So what does this have to do with disease control? A whole lot. When you over fertilize things, you're gonna get luxurious growth and the, the insects, and there's some diseases that will take advantage of that. They know the difference. And in terms of um, uh, fertil uh, the watering, again, it's, if you over water, you're gonna flood things. That's a no-no. We just already, we've already talked about that. So you want to use your tensiometer, you, some way that you know exactly what you're doing, especially under plastic mulch, how much uh, water you're putting on. Microbials, there's a lot of new stuff out there that will help, that's natural, uh, that will help in your uh, management of, of diseases and insects. These are just a sampling of what you can, you can purchase. Uh, Microtrol. It's a uh, contact inside, it's a fungus that, it's an insecticide. Can you believe that? Uh, using a fungus to control insects, okay? Um, you spray it on the foliage, you can, and of course it'll run down in the soil, but it's primarily uh, contact insecticide. This actinovate, streptomyces, that's a, that's a bacteria. It's isolated from the soil, and they've, they've industrialized this, they supercharged it. And it's good for everything. They can spray it on, it's for, for mainly for fungus, 
So they spray it on the foliage. You can drench the soil with it. Great stuff. Regalia is a natural plant extract that boosts the immune system of the plants. And then this root shield is another fun, fungi, trichoderma. Um, it's kind of like the mycorrhiza. It colonizes the roots and it just crowds out all the bad guys. It won't allow, well, it minimizes the attack of the pythium, the rhizoctonia, uh, the, all those plant pathogenic fungi. It just keeps them from infecting the roots. So it's a natural way of, of controlling, okay? And then those are the microbials. We also have the, uh, the beneficial insects, and these are more common to us. To me, they're a little harder to manage. That's Tracy's, this is her thing. If you want to talk about, that's her. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Thank you for taking my burden off my back. But uh, that's, this, is her, this is what she's done her research on and stuff, using a lot of this stuff. So you have to be careful, though, and I'll just say this. Depending on where you're at, what location you're at and the time of year and what your pests are, there are different species of the predatory mites. There's different uh, predatory bugs and these parasitic wasps. Um, so you kind of got to know where you're at and what you're doing, right? To, to, to best, you want to suit these up. Um, but they, they do work well. Managing these is a little more difficult than just spraying a pesticide. Um, and that's, that's why you want to you do your homework, you want to discuss it, and then try it, okay? Don't bet the bank on the whole, the first time you do it. It'll, you, you know, it's a learning curve, I guess what I'm saying. Chemical control, this is the most straightforward, easiest thing. I've put some organic materials up here. Um, these are the tried and true. You can't go wrong with these. Now, there's a lot of different stuff labeled for, for insects um, in, a, in a hoop house. Um, it's not a greenhouse, you can kind of consider it a field, but it depend, just read the label, okay? But Azera is a, Azera is a mixture of pyrethrin and neem, and so you, it helps prevent the development of resistance when you use those two together. And then the JMS style oil, that's a highly refined mineral oil, you can't, re, uh, you can't develop resistance to that. It just smothers things. It, they can't breathe, all right? The sphericals, whatever. And so I've had good luck with, with these materials. Um, and then there's off brands, there's generics and so forth, okay? All right, before you do any spraying, of course, scout, right? You want to know what you're spraying for, especially insects. Don't just spray when you feel like it. Just look and see what you got. And uh, if you need some help, call Tracy. She, she said she'd help you. All right, so design and locate your structures for maximum ventilation. Don't crowd plants. Use disease-resistant varieties. Purchase seed from somebody you can trust, and, tr and plants do. Rotate crops. Observe good sanitation, just like you would at home. Include soil solarization, in, uh, insect netting, fertilizer and water application. Uh, do those on schedules. Don't just... Do them by the you know, seat of your pants. And then apply uh, your pesticides, whether they're natural, the biological, or synthetic, based on the label, obviously, and then just good established practice. Okay? I think I'm done. Oh, there, is a, there are a few references there for you. Mm -hmm.